Now, everybody knows about the telegraph. We have that telegraph key where Morse and Vail sent that message between Washington and Baltimore. What a lot of people don't realize is the telegraph had another piece of equipment with it. The telegraph really wasn't about, it was about Morse code and dots and dashes, but it was much more like a fax machine. This was called the register. And basically, the first telegraphs had a paper tape that ran through it, kind of like a ticker tape. And so what you would do is you do, you know, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 on the key. The register would spool the tape, leave an indentation, and then you'd look at the indentation. You say, oh, two dashes, two dots, you know, and you, you kind of read it like that. Well, what happened with the invention, of course, is telegraphers would be able to hear the dots and dashes. They could just write them down. They didn't need the tape anymore. So that part of the invention disappears. So, but it, it started out completely, you know, very different from what we usually think of it. Now, the first head of the Smithsonian, Joseph Henry, was very interested because the telegraph to him was like the Blackberry or the, cell, the smartphone today. Because it allowed certain things. What the telegraph allowed for was crowdsourcing. They did not use that term in the 1840s. But what Joseph Henry did is he was interested, he was a physicist, came from Albany, head of the Smithsonian, he was interested in the weather and predicting the weather. And so what he did is he said, wow, we have a telegraph. I'm gonna send thermometers and barometers to hundreds of people around the country, kind of like weather buddies. And we got, he got use of the telegraph for free. So every morning in Cincinnati and St. Louis and every evening in those towns in Chicago and Kansas City, people would telegraph in measurements of the weather. Joseph Henry lived in the Smithsonian Castle there on the mall. He'd get up, and at first he was getting all these things. He didn't have a way of organizing it. And then he put up a map of the United States, and he started drawing in, okay, 72 degrees here, 64 degrees, 58 degrees. That became the first weather map. And that was the beginning of the National Weather Service. And basically, he was crowdsourcing the weather. And at that time, tremendously important as we were an agricultural country. So it, it allowed for predicting of seasons and weather patterns and so on. Now, we have a wonderful exhibit, uh, as uh, David was saying, of, of, of gold. Th this is marvelous. If you haven't spent time just looking at everything from you know, gold bars and ingots to, to wonderful bling to uh, wonderful kind of metaphoric uses uh, of gold, and, and Smithsonian is very proud to have uh, uh, lent uh, a number of these objects. Um, this one was the one that really changed the country, and that was the gold flake from Sutter's Mill that was first discovered. Now, you'll be glad to know it is not that big. <laughs> When, when uh, John Marshall first discovered that little piece of gold, it was less, it was smaller than the, the nail on my pinky. So it was just a glint. But that caused millions of people ahead west, changed the nature of the country, uh, and uh, uh, certainly showed that small things could make a big uh, difference, as we later learned from California as well, with Silicon Valley and computer technology. We have at the Smithsonian iconic objects, Abraham Lincoln's hat, the hat he took off on that Good Friday at Ford's Theater, put it down next to him on his, uh, while he was seated, seating, uh, watching the play, was assassinated. That was locked up in the Smithsonian basement for 20-something years because the secretary of the Smithsonian did not want it to become an object of veneration but now it's one of our iconic objects. And we have tremendous objects of slavery, documenting slavery from Harriet Tubman's hymnal to you know, uh, uh, amber types of Frederick Douglass to versions of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, posters and so on. And right now we are completing, uh, by Sept on September 24th, 2016, President Obama will cut the ribbon on the new African American History and Culture Museum on the Mall next to the Washington Monument. Amazing, amazing building uh, designed from, by David Ajay and just amazing uh, artifacts and uh, artwork in it telling really the, 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 a tremendous story of struggle and freedom in our country. 
Um, this guy used to show his paintings here in New York, uh, uh, Bierstadt, Albert Bierstadt, this painting among others. This is probably worth, I don't know, about 120, 140 million dollars. But when Bierstadt would show them, he'd take an audience like this, he'd have like curtains and stuff, he probably played some funky music, and he'd unve unveil these great panoramic paintings of the West. There was no color photography. The only way you can get it. This was after the Civil War. He worked for the railroad companies. The whole idea was to show the West as this wonderful, ideal place that you should come and visit. And these paintings we now regard as masterpieces, but at that time they were like the IMAX theater of the, you know, the 1880s. It was uh, 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 advertising at its best. What is the Statue of Liberty doing in the Smithsonian? See, you think you have the original Statue of Liberty out here, New York Harbor, but the one in the Smithsonian really well predates that. So when they were raising money for the you know, Statue of Liberty, you know, started out as a French project to honor the American centennial, and uh, the French people, not the government, raised the money for the statue. The obligation on the American people was to provide an island, uh, provide for the, um, uh, the uh, infrastructure and the base. And somehow the Americans were lagging behind, they couldn't get behind, you know, behind this project, and we weren't coming up with the money. And so there's an effort, how do you convince Americans to come up with the money, fork over the money? And actually, New York almost lost the Statue of Liberty to Cleveland. <laughs> I mean, to Cleveland. So all these other cities wanted the Statue of Liberty. And, um, but uh, the, the first attempt, uh, 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 Laboulaye and others, were, were, was to get the Americans to raise it. They thought they could convince Congress. So they had a model of the Statue of Liberty made, because that's how, that's how uh, Eiffel and others were designing the, uh, the, the Statue of Liberty, to get it so um, you'd make a, a smaller model and then you know, just multiply every dimension and make it bigger and bigger. And so they took a model of the Statue of Liberty and they sent it to the US Congress to put it in the rotunda. And the whole idea was to shame Congress into giving money to build the Statue of Liberty. Well, guess what? It didn't work. <laughs> and a guy named Joseph Pulitzer <laughs> and others and many New Yorkers put together the money and ended up building the Statue of Liberty. And when they finally did, the model that had been in the rotunda of the Capitol came to the Smithsonian. Now, another wonderful story and very unexpected. It's tremendous where you get like interesting sources of creativity uh, and innovation. So object number 37 in my book is the American bison or buffalo. Well, how did you get buffalo in the Smithsonian? Well, we have a lot of paintings, of course, and buffalo were celebrated in American art very early on, but we had this guy, William Hornaday, at the Smithsonian. He was a taxidermist in the 1870s. He, did, he started doing census of animals, but he stuffed animals for exhibits at the Smithsonian. He got very interested because he wanted to stuff a buffalo. We had buffalo skins at the Smithsonian. He wanted to get it right. And if you're a taxidermist, you need to see the living animal because you want to look at the muscle you know, you want to get that movement so the animal looks alive, but he'd never seen a living buffalo. So what does Hornady do? He, he's at the Smithsonian Mounts and ex Expedition, Smithsonian people, they go out west, they try to find buffalo. Can't find any buffalo. Goes that spring. Goes back again in the fall, uh, I think 1883, and finally he comes across a small group of buffalo, including a youngin who he names Sandy. They draw the buffalo in the wild, it's time to go home, like shoot the buffalo. He doesn't have a buffalo have disappeared. Americans have slaughtered 50 million buffalo in a matter of decades. So what does he do with Sandy and Sandy's mommy and Sandy's daddy? He takes them back to Washington, builds a, a, a fence, and we have buffalo on the mall outside the Smithsonian Castle in Washington. Well, people in Washington had never seen buffalo, live buffalo. So they come and they start coming to the Smithsonian to see the live buffalo. And then they say, okay, what else do you got for us? So the Smithsonian people are a little flustered. They start acquiring other, getting other animals. It becomes like Noah's Ark. 
They end up with about 120 animals, and that becomes the National Zoo. And then later, there's a great parade, like by 1889, to the current location of the National Zoo in Rock Creek. Um, Sandy didn't make it. <laughs> Sandy did get, get stuffed with mommy and daddy and did get into the Smithsonian. Um, but Hornaday went on, amazingly enough, he had a dispute with the head of the Smithsonian, a guy named Langley, uh, and so Hornaday came up here. And he started another zoo, another institution, based on his experience at the Smithsonian, and that zoo was called the Bronx Zoo. And Hornaday was a long, collect, uh, a long uh, serving director of that. Got tied up with a guy named Teddy Roosevelt, who was close to the Smithsonian, museum here in the zoo, and really got going the conservation movement movement in the United States. And that's how we get Buffalo Nichols and everything else, and Buffaloes as mascots, and whole conservation movement. So just think about it. The conservation movement in the United States starts with a taxidermist. Just a wonderful, wonderful idea. Okay, so I, what I tell people, young people over there, you have a smartphone? You have a smartphone? iPhone? Blackberry, some of you do, I know, I know you're shy. Okay, you have telephone. This is what it started out looking like. This is what your iPhone started as. This is what Alexander Graham Bell invented when he invented the telephone. And what he was interested in, in inventing is electronic speech to help his wife and his mother who were deaf. What he ended up doing, again, a wonderful irony, is he invents a technology that cuts out deaf people. <laughs> and allows people to talk. What we found with Alexander Graham Bell, he was fighting with Edison all the time for to, uh, who would invite, invent what, and he was playing around with recorded sound. Both he and Edison were trying to invent recorded sound, and Bell locked in the basement of the Smithsonian Castle, because he, he thought he'd get into a patent fight, all these recordings he had made, uh, and um, we never could play them at the Smithsonian. We opened them up, I think, in the 1930s. He had deposited them maybe around the turn of the century. Uh, we opened up, we couldn't figure out what they were, and just recently, we've been able to basically read his old recordings using a laser. So you do a laser, you know, you read like the grooves of something, and then you turn the laser into a print, and then you turn the print into sound. And just it was last year that we could finally hear. <laughs> So we could hear that voice of Alexander Graham Bell coming to us 120, 130 years later. Just marvelous.